For, For by, by grace, grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good, good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. I chose that scripture because it brings out the fact that when we come to know the Lord Jesus and are born again, God has already prepared good works for us. We don't have to plan our own lives. We have to find out what God's plan is. There's another scripture along the same lines in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 which says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's a staggering thought. God had a plan for the life of each one of us who is a believer in eternity. And again, the application is find God's plan and walk in it. And then I remember the words of Paul in Romans chapter 15 where he said in effect, I don't want to speak about anything in my life that Christ has not done. I only want to talk about the things that he has done. And that's my purpose tonight. Uh, the title, title of my message is How I Became Involved in Israel. And it was totally the sovereignty of God. I was the typical non-Jewish intellectual. I, at the time that my story begins, I had a teaching position in philosophy at Cambridge University. And I had majored in Latin and Greek and the classics. And I knew absolutely nothing about Israel, the Jewish people, or the Middle East. I was highly educated in some areas and abysmally ignorant in others. Well, when the Second World War broke out, if you can believe that people were alive that long ago, <laughs> I uh, realized I was going to be called up into the British Army and I had one major problem. What shall I take with me to read? Because my life consisted in reading books and a few other things, which I won't mention, and uh, which weren't at all connected with reading books. So I thought it over and I said to myself, here I am, I'm supposed to be a teacher of philosophy, but there's one book of philosophy in the world which is more widely read and more influential than any other book. And I know very little about what's in it. You know the book I had in mind? The Bible. That's an unchallengeable fact. Undoubtedly, it is the most widely read and influential book in the history of the human race. So I felt it was my philosophic duty to study the Bible. And so when I went into the army, I brought myself a nice new black Bible in the old King James Version and took it with me and started to study the Bible. Now I said to myself, how do you study the Bible? And I said, just like any other book. It's a book like any other. Start at the beginning and read it through to the end. So my first night in the British Army, 12th of September 1940, in a barrack room of 25 new recruits, I sat down on my bed, opened my Bible, and started reading at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. What I hadn't allowed for is that anybody seen reading the Bible in the army immediately becomes very conspicuous. And I hadn't anticipated the reaction. The thing was that I baffled everybody, including myself, because when I wasn't reading the Bible, I didn't live the least bit like somebody who regularly reads the Bible. <laughs> I found it boring, baffling, and unattractive. But I said to myself, no book is going to beat me. I'll read it through from beginning to end. After nine months in the army, 
I had got somewhere about the middle of the book of Job. <laughs> and I now compare myself with some professing Christians and I think I didn't do badly. <laughs> and then something totally life transforming happened. I cannot give you the details. But in the middle of the night, in an army barrack room, I had a personal encounter with somebody I had never met before. And the thing I want to emphasize is that praying for the first time in my life about the middle of the night, not knowing whom to pray to or what to say, I found myself suddenly in the presence of an unknown person. I did not see this person physically, but I was clearly aware that I was in contact with him. And I felt that my whole destiny was being settled by that contact. And in desperation, I began to say to this person, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And when I got to that, I couldn't stop saying, I will not let you go. And at that point, I made contact with him. The power of God came on me. And I was under the power of God in that barrack room for well over one hour. And the next morning, I was a totally changed person. I had not made any resolutions or decisions, but something had happened in me that completely changed me. It took me months to discover all the changes that had taken place in that one encounter. Now I mentioned that encounter because I realized later that I was saying to that person exactly what Jacob said to the angel whom he met and who wrestled with him. And this was a critical moment in the life of Jacob because if you read the story, it's in Genesis 32, and I'll turn there in a moment. Jacob was on his way back to the land promised him as an inheritance after being away probably 14 years or more. But he could not get back into the land until he had encountered this person. And his destiny, like mine, was decided by that encounter. There was one other person that Jacob had to meet, and that was his twin brother Esau. The last time they'd been together, Esau was preparing to kill him. And this is a sort of historical parable. Because the time has come for the Jewish people to return to their inheritance. But they've got to deal with two persons before it's settled. The first is that mysterious person whom Jacob met, and I'll give you his identity in a moment. The other is Esau, the brother. And uh, I didn't intend to go into this, but it was a dramatic moment when Jacob encountered Esau. And he did something that he would never have done if he hadn't encountered the other person first. He humbled himself. And he bowed seven times to the ground before his offended brother. And his, one, his brother was won back into a relationship. And I personally believe that is something that has to happen to God's people Israel. They've got to meet that unknown stranger and settle with him. And then they have to settle with their offended brother. Now, let me just read a few words from the encounter of Jacob with the angel. It says, a man met him, a man, and wrestled with him all night. And the next morning, Jacob called the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I have, met, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So this person was a man, but he was also God. And at the end of his life, 
when he was blessing the two sons of Joseph. He referred to this encounter again. And he said in Genesis 48, 15, he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me or shepherded me, shepherded me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. So you have an amazing revelation that Jacob encountered a person who was both man and God and an angel, which is a messenger from God to man. And because I believe of God's purpose in my life, I came to know that same person nearly 4,000 years later. And I have no doubt as to the identity of that person. There's only one person in the universe who answers to that description. A man, God, and a messenger from God to man. And he was manifested in human history as Jesus of Nazareth. And I want to say to each of you, you can join a church, you can become religious, you can go through all sorts of religious rituals and stay very much the same. But when you meet Jesus, you will be changed. No one can meet Jesus and stay the same. About, just about a week later, God baptized me in the Holy Spirit in the same barrack room. I was such a pagan, I didn't know you had to go to church to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and God gave me the gift of tongues. And again, I was so ignorant, I didn't know you had to wait six months to get spiritual gifts. <laughs> so God immediately gave me the gift of interpretation. And every time I spoke in tongues, I got the interpretation. Well, one of the things that I kept getting, every time almost I spoke in tongues, it was God. And he was saying to me, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And I thought to myself, well, you know, that's historically true, but why is it so important? But gradually, and bear in mind, I was very much a Gentile, very unspiritual. Gradually, it was borne in upon me that that's important. He is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And one of the most astonishing facts in the Bible is the fact that he revealed that name to Moses. I tell people, if you've never been surprised by the Bible, you've never really read it. Because it is an astonishing book. And in this encounter that Moses had with the Lord at the burning bush, he said to Moses said to God, well, if you're sending me back to the children of Israel, at least tell me your name. Who am, I, who am I to say I've met? And the Lord answered, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, The Lord, that's the sacred name, Yahweh, The Lord, God of your fathers, The God of Abraham, The God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. And I became aware of an astonishing fact that Almighty God, the creator of the universe, has chosen to be known forever as the God of three men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All weak, fallible men. And yet that's his memorial forever. God's ways are so different from ours. We would never have planned that. We would never have thought of it. Especially Jacob. I mean, I could understand the God of Abraham. Even maybe Isaac. But when he says, I'm the God of Jacob, it's astonishing. But, Dear friends, it's true. 
And God impressed upon me that I needed to know that. I don't think I would have ever been openly anti-Semitic. But I certainly wasn't a friend to the Jewish people. I had two Jewish friends in all of my college career. Uh, but they were so assimilated, the only way you could know they were Jewish was their name was Kish. <laughs> and uh, my attitude, I think, was like that of a lot of intellectuals. Well, I wouldn't persecute the Jewish people. I'd give them their just civil rights. But there must be something wrong with them that they're always in trouble. I think a lot of people think like that, really. And I'm sorry, Lord, I repent. It was my ignorance. It was my carnality. Well, I was in the army, as I say, and it was the second year of the war. And we were due to go overseas from Britain. And at that time, because of the danger of U-boats and all sorts of things, they never told you where you were going. So we just knew our unit was going overseas. And I had made friends with a wonderful Pentecostal family who were the people who took me in when no one else wanted me and through whom I eventually made my contact with the Lord. And I said to them, it's a funny thing, but everywhere I go, the word Palestine is in my mind. Now you have to bear in mind that in that time, up to 1948, what is now called Israel and Jordan was then called Palestine. So I said, I don't know, I have this word Palestine in my mind all the time. And they said, Derek, God must be calling you to Palestine. Well, that kind of language didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know what it was to be called, and I didn't understand it. Well, sure enough, our unit was sent to the Middle East. We went there by a roundabout route because of the U-boats, so we went almost to North America, down the Atlantic, round the Cape of Good Hope, up the east coast of Africa, and eventually ended up in Suez, November 1941. The first, uh, just the beginning of December, the first piece of news that greeted us was the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. And we thought that was rather good news because it meant now the Americans would be on our side. So I spent the next three years of my military service in the Middle East, in the deserts of North Africa. And if you have never been in a real desert, it's, it's a, an important part of a person's education. I, say, I think I understand why God took Israel through the desert to their inheritance. Because a lot of us, and myself certainly, have a lot of unrealistic expectations and wants and fads. But in the desert you're stripped down to the things that really are necessary. And very little else is there. And really what you need is water, food, shelter and transportation. Well, by that time I had become a convinced and firm believer in the Bible. I was cut off from any kind of religious life. I never met a, a British uh, chaplain who knew the Lord, I'm sorry to say. And although I was seen reading the Bible every day, no chaplain ever came to me and offered to help me. But I lived with the Bible for three years without any real significant contact with Christians except for one very life-changing event. After nine, years in the, nine months in the desert, when I hadn't seen a paved road and I hadn't seen water, I was allowed to take a week's leave to Jerusalem. And really, it was just about like going from hell to heaven in one journey. I remember that when I saw water and green foliage, I became almost delirious with excitement. <laughs> and then I got to Jerusalem, 
And I think of the words of Psalm 102, which is so vivid because of that. Psalm 102 is the psalm that promises the restoration of Zion. And it says about Jerusalem in verse 14, For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. And I'd have to say the two most obvious features of the landscape were the stones and the dust. And there was plenty of both. But I met an elderly Christian lady who'd lived in Jerusalem many years and she said one thing to me which was very significant. She said, Derek, you don't choose Jerusalem. Jerusalem chooses you. And at that moment, I knew Jerusalem had chosen me. That's something I have never doubted from 1942 until this time. Well, during the period I was in the desert, I became sick with a skin condition which the doctors couldn't heal. And I spent exactly one year in military hospitals in Egypt. And that is not the kind of place where you'd want to be in a military hospital. And I did not get out of hospital until God had taught me the secret of divine healing. I lay in bed and said to myself day after day after day, I know if I had faith, God would heal me. But the next thing I always said was, I don't have faith. And when I said that, I was in what John Bunyan called the slough of despond, the dark, lonely valley of despair. But in that darkness, a brilliant light shone in, which was Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I latched onto those two words, faith cometh. And I want to leave that thought with every one of you. If you don't have faith, you can get it. It comes by hearing the Word of God. So I made up my mind to read the Bible through once more, and I armed myself with a blue pencil, which is not always used for that kind of purpose, and I determined to underline in blue everything that had to do with healing, health, physical strength, and long life. And when I'm finished, you know what I had? A blue Bible. <laughs> I was convinced it was the will of God to heal. But there was one particular passage of scripture that actually got me out of hospital. It was Proverbs 4, verses 20 through 22, which says, My son, and I realized it was God speaking to me, attend to my words, Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. And when I read those last words, I said, not even a philosopher can make flesh mean anything but the physical body. And the t alternative reading in the margin for health was medicine. So I made a decision to take God's word as my medicine. I happened to be a medical orderly, so I was familiar with how people take medicine. And I said, I'll do the same, three times daily after meals. And I did that for three or four months. I was transferred to the most unhealthy climate, I think in all of Africa, which was the Sudan. And in that climate, without further medication, the medicine of God's word completely and permanently healed me. So God was putting me through a school. Well, in the Sudan, I ended up in a very wild and desolate area in what's called the Red Sea Hills in a small military hospital. And I found myself directly exposed to the Sudanese, whose language is Arabic and who are all Muslims. And God gave me a supernatural love for those people. By nature, they are not lovable. There's very little that's attractive. 
And because of the love God gave me, I had the privilege of leading to the Lord the first member of the Hadandawa tribe who had ever confessed faith in Christ. But I say that because I believe it was a very important part of God's preparation. He didn't intend me, ultimately, to minister to those people. His plan was for me to cast in my lot with the Jews. But I think it's very important, no matter how much we may be concerned about Israel and the Jewish people, that we realize God loves every nation. God loves all people. And uh, actually, if you'll forgive my saying so, one thing that convinces me that a Jew has really been born again is when he has a love for other nations. And so I think God put me through that training. Well, at the end of three years, I was transferred to what was then Palestine. And I ended up in a very small medical depot in what was then a little village called Kiryat Motskin, which is now a part of, the, of Haifa, the north of Haifa. But I'd heard in Sudan that if you really, from another Christian, if you really want a blessing, there's a little children's home in Ramallah, which was then a small Christian village. Christian nominal, not, not what we'd call evangelical. Run by a Danish lady. And if you really want to be blessed, that's where you need to go. And I mean, during that period, hundreds of soldiers from the forces, American, British, uh, Australian, New Zealand, went to that little home where the lady, whose name was Lydia Christensen, had a little family of eight fatherless girls. And uh, when the soldiers came in, Lydia would wave them to the seat, to a chair and say, kneel down, and they'd start to pray. And the little girls would start to pray, and the Spirit of God almost invariably fell. So I thought, I need this. After three years in the desert, I need some refreshing. So I made my way from Kiryat Motskin to that home in Ramallah, and I was so impressed by the peace uh, you know, military life is not a peaceful kind of life, even when you're not fighting. But there was a, such an atmosphere of peace in that home. It was like stepping out of one environment into a new environment. And there was very little peace all around it, because an Arab village is not a peaceful place. So when I got back to Kiryat Modskin, I had plenty of time, because I was supervising a team of Basuto soldiers, caring for bales of medical supplies. It was not a challenging job. And so I would walk up and down in the midst of these bales, praying and worshipping, and almost invariably I would speak in tongues. Now by this time I'd learned that I didn't have to take the interpretation. God, I said to God, do I always have to interpret? He said, no, you make the decision. because. When, believe it or not, I interpreted everything I spoke in tongues for a while. So I was walking up and down, and then the Spirit of God came on me, and I spoke very powerfully in a tongue. And I knew I'd got the interpretation, which wasn't lengthy. But it was God speaking to me personally, and in those days he spoke in King James English. <laughs> which is, you know, the... the, the pinnacle of the English language. It's declined sadly since those days. And there are certain advantages, because you distinguish between the you plural and thou singular, which you can't do in modern English. And this is what the Lord said to me, and I remember every word. I have called thee to be a teacher of the scriptures in truth and faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus for many. Now I was still a corporal, all the electronic media and all that had not developed. But since that, which is now 49 years, God has fulfilled his word. And I don't want to be boastful, but to give God the glory. I regularly teach millions of people 
every day because my radio broadcast is in 10 languages besides English, five Chinese languages, Russian, Spanish, Arabic, Mongolian, and Tongan. And it has been going for six or eight years into China, in Chinese, and into Russia, in Russian. And literally millions of people listen every day to that teaching. I say that just to de demonstrate the faithfulness of God. He said for many, I wouldn't have had any conception at that time of what many would mean. Well a little later I was pacing up and down this depot and the Spirit of God came upon me. Well, I thought, I need to pray for that Danish lady. Because there she is, she's tired, she's overworked, she has very little help, and she has the financial burden of those children, and obviously very little money. So I thought, my duty is to pray for her. And as I was praying for her, again, the Lord gave me tongue and interpretation. And this was astonishing. The Lord said, I've joined you together under the same yoke and in the same harness, the message of blessing and the hand of power. I thought, what does that mean? <laughs> I thought, it must mean that God wants us to work together. Well, you couldn't have thought of anything less unlikely because I was a bachelor, an only child, I never had brothers or sisters. Girls were a mysterious unknown quantity to me and how could God send me to a home with a single lady and eight girls? <laughs> However, I am, I'm fairly bold at times. So the next time I got to Ramallah, I said to Lydia, I said, I think God wants us to work together. Her answer was absolutely typical. She said, God will have to work on both ends of the chain. <laughs> However, I became a regular visitor at the home because the army had transferred me to Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see this. This is where I ended my military service. How many of you know Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives? The big hospital there, which is now a Lutheran hospital. The Augusta Victoria building. Well, it was a military hospital in the war and I was posted to it. That's where I ended my military service. That's where I got my discharge. Think of the faithfulness of God. I had no control over my own destiny. The army could have sent me anywhere. And it took me precisely where God wanted me to be. Well, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I ended up by marrying the lady. <laughs> and, and I married her because I loved her and she loved me. And we had complete harmony about Israel and the destiny of the Jewish people. She was a Dane, as I say, and you probably know the Danes have been unusually pro-Israel most of their history. But afterwards, afterwards, my wife is showing me that I should show you a book. Probably most of you know it, called Appointment in Jerusalem. It's the story of how Lydia went out and started to take in one little dying Jewish baby and out of that came the children's home. So if you haven't read it, I tell you, I've never met anybody who wasn't moved by that book. And interestingly enough, it has been given to probably a hundred Jewish people. And it's a very clear testimony about Jesus but never has one Jewish person been offended by that book. And many have been stirred by it. So, what was I saying when I made that? Just trying to remind me. Well, anyhow, we got married. That's the, the bottom line. <laughs> so, there I was. There were eight girls, ranging in age from, I think, 16 at that time to three. Six of them were Jewish. One was an Arab, Palestinian Arab, and one was English. And let me just say this. 
I want to impress upon you that when God initiates something, it works. And the only things that work are what God initiates. Now, there are plenty of things I've done that God didn't initiate that didn't work, but I'm talking about what God has done tonight. Today, which is 46, nearly 50 years later, the family of which I am now the head, because Lydia went to be with the Lord in 1975, numbers something over 120 members, and they are scattered through three continents. They live in England, Canada, the United States, and Australia. And I have about 35 grandchildren and about 45 plus great-grandchildren and one great-great-great-grandchild. And they are a close family, closer than many natural families. That is the sovereign grace of God. But it also is a testimony to Lydia's character that she built such a sense of family into those girls. Sometimes people call them orphans and they would get offended. They would say, we're not orphans. We have a mother. And eventually they said, we have a father too. <laughs> I must tell you about one Jewish girl whose name was Ruhama, she's changed her name now so it doesn't identify her. But um, she was typically Jewish, uh, dark, olive skinned, but the little English girl was very blonde and golden hair and blue eyes. So one Arab in the village said, how come you're so dark and your sister is so fair? And Ruhama didn't hesitate. She said, my father is dark and my mother is fair. <laughs> <laughs> so, there we were. Now, at that time, the real tension between Jews and Arabs was really developing. And it became unsafe for us to live any longer in an Arab village. During the World War II, the Arabs had been very kind and loving to the Jewish girls. And many of them still would have been, but there would have been others who would probably have done harm to them. So we had to move, we moved into Jerusalem, and we settled in a house which is today number 90 Hebron Road. If you ever want to find it, you can find it. It wasn't Hebron Road in those days, and it wasn't number 90. And uh, then came the 29th of November, 1947. You know what happened then, don't you? There's a street in Jerusalem named the 29th of November. What happened? The United Nations voted to partition Palestine and give the Jews a state. They didn't know what that would mean in the land. But after that, Jews and Arabs no longer trusted one another. Up to that time, they had lived, on the whole, fairly peacefully with one another. And so in Jerusalem, there were some areas that were totally Arab, some areas that were totally Jewish, they didn't change. But there were mixed areas where there were Arabs and Jews. And without anybody saying anything, each group sized the other up and decided who was the stronger and the weaker ones moved out. And they didn't take a lot of luggage or furniture with them because people seen moving became targets for snipers. At that time, by that time, there were snipers in Jerusalem on the housetops who would shoot at anything. They'd shoot at a cat or a piece of paper or a human being. Well, we lived in a mixed area called at that time Upper Baka. And uh, Lydia and I said to ourselves, well listen, we are Christians, we're both Arabs and Jews, and this fight isn't for us, so we'll stay. Well, we lived on the two top floors of the house. The bottom floor was an office of a Jewish businessman who had a Muslim Arab office boy. The Jewish businessman disappeared we didn't see him anymore, the Muslim Arab boy stayed and looked after the lower floor. 
Well, one night, one of our daughters went just a few houses down the road for a piano lesson. It was about dusk. As she came back, she saw a truckload of Arab Legion soldiers right in front of our house, and they were talking to the office boy. Now, the Arab Legion was probably the most efficient Arab military force in the Middle East, trained and officered by British. And they were theoretically part of the security forces in Jerusalem. But there was no security for Jews where they were. I mean, I don't want to seem biased. I mean, that was just a fact. So the moment this little girl saw these, bo these soldiers talking to the office boy, she knew something was wrong. So instead of going in through the front, she went round the back, up the side stairs to the second floor, dropped on her hands and knees, crawled out to a balcony, which is still there today, and listened to what they were saying. Now she was fluent in Arabic. And they were inquiring how many people lived in the house and what kind of people were they. The office boy was saying they're mostly women and mostly Jewish and giving the ages of the girls. And so the, uh, the legionaries said, um, we'll be back. What's the best time? And the office boy said, if you're here at midnight, there's no one around. Well, our daughter knew well enough what was intended. So, interestingly, we were having a prayer meeting. And uh, there was a British c police constable who'd come seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And just about that time, my wife Lydia got a tongue, and I got interpretation. And it began, I have delivered you from the snare of the fowler. So, well, as I gave that interpretation, the daughter burst into the room, and she looked as if she'd seen a ghost. And she told us what had happened. Well, we knew enough about Jerusalem and the Middle East to know that this was no idle threat. So, first of all, the British constable went out and said, I'll phone police headquarters, find out what to do. Well, the message was that maybe at midnight they would have a police patrol there, which would be one British constable, one Jewish constable, and one Arab constable. Well, the Arab would never turn against his fellow Arabs. And one Jew and one British against a truckload of Arab legionaries would not be much. So we knew nothing to do. We have to go. It was seven o'clock when this happened, so Lydia cooked a little food, which nobody was very excited to eat. And we said to the girls, now make up a little bundle of the things you need most that you can carry in your hand. And it was interesting because every one of the first things she put in the bundle was her Bible. And at nine o'clock at night, very quietly, we filed out into the totally dark, deserted streets of Jerusalem. No one went out after dark. There were snipers around, and you didn't, didn't know what might happen. I took the youngest little girl, the English girl, in my arms and led the way. And then the girls followed in age order, and Lydia came behind and very quietly closed the door. That was the last the family ever saw in that home. We didn't know where to go, but in the middle of Jerusalem, there was a British security zone surrounded by a, a wall of barbed wire as high as this ceiling. No one was permitted in it without a special pass. But we felt that's the only place we could go to. So the constable said, well, I'll go with you and I can go in. So he went in and we stood for about 40 minutes at the entrance. And I remember the British soldier that was in the sandbag sentry box was very polite and got up and gave Lydia his seat so she could sit down. The, the soldier went to the commanding officer, the, the, police, the policeman went to the commanding officer and told the story and said, can they come in? And after a while, the commanding officer said, all right, let them in. So the news was, you can come in. Well, it was 11 o'clock at night by then. 
<coughs> we knew there was an American Assembly of God mission building in the security zone. We knew the missionaries. So around about 11.15, we turned up and said, here we are, can you take us in? Well, they were wonderful. They said, we'll put mattresses down, so on. So there we were, we're sleeping. The next day, at about midday, the, the missionary in charge of the building took Lydia and me aside and said, we've had a message from the Muslims that if you keep the Jewish girls in that building, they'll burn the building down. Now he said, we have a pregnant woman here and other women, and we can't afford to take that risk. So he said, you and Sister Prince are welcome to stay, but the girls will have to move. Well, we said, we're one family. Where we go, they go, and where they go, we go. So 24 hours later, we were out in the streets of Jerusalem again. This time, we ended up in a British mission, which was in what had become no man's land. If you've heard of the Mandelbaum Gate, you probably remember that, some of you. Well, that's just about where it was. They took us in, and they were kind and hospitable. That's where we spent Christmas 1947. But all around, there were people fighting. And not a major fighting, but just people shooting at one another. So we never walked in past the windows. We always dropped down, crawled on the floor. <coughs> then we got a word that the American missionaries were going home and they needed somebody to look after the building. So would we like the job? Well, I mean, it was the only hope for us. So we moved back into the building, the missionaries moved out, they sold us their canned goods, and so we had some food. Well, by this time, Jewish Jerusalem was under siege because the Arabs all around were cutting off all the convoys that should have brought food into Jerusalem. And the British administration was siding with the Arabs. So they didn't arrest the Arabs, but if they saw Jews with rifles, they arrested them and took the rifles. So by um, April 1948, the city was virtually starving. Um, I actually saw Jewish residents, doctors and dentists and people like that, going around the outside of our house, picking up grass to see if they could get some food. And people had no heating material, so they would break up packing cases and light a fire and kindle it in the gutter to heat there. Well, because the American missionaries had left their food supply behind, we had enough to eat. Then, on the 13th of May, about nine o'clock in the evening, there was a knock at the door and a British officer was there and he said, I want to tell you, we're moving out. Tomorrow you'll be under the Jews because they are taking over this part of the city. The next day, there was a nice little note on our door from a young man who signed himself Phineas Pinchas. And he said, I'm in charge of the Haganah for this area. We want to set up, Will may we set up a post in your garden. Well, we knew they'd do it whether we said yes or no, so we said yes, and anyhow, we were glad to have them there. So we shared our garden from then onwards with the Haganah. Then, 14th of May, the war started, what they call the War of Independence. And at that time, there were less than 600,000 Jews in the whole country and they were surrounded by Arab states numbering 40 million, most of whom had armies with modern equipment. And I, I'm British, and I, I'm saying this, I was, I was there. I think the British calculated the Jews just cannot hold out. We better side with the Arabs. And I would have to say that I witnessed a miracle something I think just as miraculous as some of the battles described in the Bible in the Old Testament. You know what happened? 
600,000 Jews routed 40 million Arabs. Six armies. And Lydia had been through a lot of previous troubles. She'd seen Jews with nothing better to defend themselves than a broomstick with, an, with a carving knife on, bound on the end. So she said, this time we're going to pray. And I am not anti-anybody. But we prayed specifically that God would paralyze the Arabs. Because we knew that was the only hope of survival. And actually the Jewish authorities said to Jewish women with daughters, keep a revolver loaded with one bullet for your daughter and one for yourself, but don't get taken alive. <coughs> and uh, after that, these Haganah boys and girls, because they were both, would come to us, and we, we became very friendly with them. They'd say, you know, we, we can't understand it. But we go into a place, and we're outnumbered, and the Arabs are better armed, and it's just as if they were paralyzed. And they used the very word that we had been praying. <laughs> well then, the fighting really started in earnest, and those of you that know Jerusalem, the building we were in is on the corner of Agron and King George Avenue. Those of you that know the King's Hotel, it's Kitty Tony across. It is now a conservative Jewish synagogue or center. But at that time it was still an Assembly of God building. Then the Arab Legion started shelling the city from Nebi Samuel, which is the the highest area north of the city. And they started firing a hundred pound shells. The first hundred pound shell landed just behind our house. And two of our girls, one of the Jewish and one the Arab, were sitting in the window and the blast knocked them down and a piece of shrapnel went through the window between their heads. And uh, so the a little Arab girl came in and said, Mama, Mama, a bomb's come into the house. We said, nonsense, couldn't come in. Well, come and see, she said. So we ran to the room, and there was a hole in the plaster of the wall opposite the window, and at the bottom was, was a large shell fragment. So being incautious, I picked it up, and it was still too hot to hold. So I dropped it and waited until it cooled and I picked it up and it was most of the base of a hundred pound shell and being British I was interested to notice that stamped on it were made in Britain. So I said thank you Britain. <laughs> well, we survived. That house at that time had 23 rooms, it has more now. But there was a laundry room in the basement where they just did the laundry. That's where we lived, all of us, everybody, one family, one room. And every now and then I would slip out, much to Lydia's disapproval, and go up to the attic and watch the fighting, which was interesting. I mean, I, I saw it. I saw the Jews raise their flag over Barclays Bank, which was one of the main focal points. And that's the first time I'd ever seen, I think, the Magen David, the Star of David, raised like that. So, then there was a ceasefire imposed by the United Nations. And when we emerged and went up to our living room, we counted approximately a hundred spent bullets on the floor of the living room. Now, the front of the house, we couldn't go out because it was directly exposed to the snipers. But I would go out to the side entrance, cross the street, and go down to a little grocery store. And we had got the first ration cards ever issued in Hebrew. I still keep them as a kind of memento. So I went to the store with the ration cards for a family of six, which we were at that time. And I said, we want a week's rations. 
And I'm convinced they treated us just like the other people. So we got a loaf of bread about as long as my arm from the elbow to my fingers and a lump of cheese about the size that I could hold in my fist. And that was a week's rations for six people. Well, I'd just like to read one scripture, which I think is appropriate. You see, a lot of, a lot of things in the Bible that I'd been reading for three months in the desert suddenly became very real to me. It was like I was reading the day's newspaper. I'll read two passages. The first is in Jeremiah 3, verse 14. At that time, we in the British Army knew very little about the Holocaust. It was something that had not been fully disclosed. But we were beginning to get Jewish survivors in Palestine. And I talked with several at different times. And they would always say something like this, Well, I'm the only member of my family that escaped in this city, but I have one relative in another city that escaped, maybe a brother or an uncle or a cousin, mostly German cities. And I read in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, and it's addressed to the north, which is Russia and Germany. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. It was so exact. I was impressed again and again that the prophetic word of God is not metaphorical. It's not approximate. It's extremely accurate. The other scripture that I, I don't believe this is the final fulfillment, but it became very real to me was Isaiah 66 verse 8. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth or the land be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion traveled, she gave birth to her children. And I realized I'd seen that happen. A nation born in a day. The 14th of May, 1948. A complete nation, a very tiny nation, a very weak nation, but with everything, a government, a police force, an army, a civil administration, in one day. I don't believe it's ever happened before. I doubt if it will ever happen again, but it was so accurate. Now, I believe there's a further spiritual application to that, but it was so vivid to me. Well, I have to continue because this is a long narrative. Later, God showed Lydia and me very clearly that we were to move to Britain, which we did with great reluctance. But I believe <coughs> God had his reasons. And I'm, I'm going to skip a whole lot now, because when I was outside of Israel, I still maintained contact, but I wasn't so immediately involved. And I believe God had a purpose <coughs> in exposing me to what was going on in the Gentile world. And so for a while I ministered in Britain, then I ministered in Kenya, then I ministered in Canada, and then I immigrated to the United States by accident, if you can understand that. Well, while we were in Kenya, Lydia and I adopted our ninth daughter. We didn't plan it. I was principal of a teacher training college and we were very busy with educational work. But one evening, a, uh, a European lady and an African couple turned up about six o'clock in the evening and the European lady was carrying a little black baby in a very dirty towel. And they asked if they could come in and we said yes. And then the European lady said, this little girl was born in a hut, her mother died, 
she was found unconscious on the floor and they took her to the hospital she's getting better but the hospital say we're not a children's home we can't keep children forever and we have been going around for three days the whole of this area looking for any family African Asian or European that would take her <clears throat> then they said we heard that you take children <laughs> so we said oh yes that was long ago but uh, not today and uh, they said, we're so tired, will you sit down? So we said, sure, sit down. They sat about half an hour, got up to go, and as this white lady carried this little black baby past me, the baby put out its hand like that, as if to say, what are you going to do about me? <laughs> so I looked at my wife, and I said, maybe we'll change our minds. And she said, give me a week to find a cot and some baby clothes and you can bring her back. So that's how we got our ninth daughter. And Lydia had always said, I'd always like to have one little black girl. So later, we had traveled through Canada, because I was associated with a Canadian mission at that time. And I had an invitation to immigrate to the States. Not to immigrate, but to visit the States a pastor in Minneapolis whom I'd met in World War II. So we got to the border and presented ourselves and they said, what are you coming for? And I said, a visit. And they said, how long? I said, six months. They said, six months is too long for a visit. <laughs> well, I dealt with a lot of immigration officials because I had to get all our family into Britain. So. I knew you don't argue. So I said, maybe you can help us. And I think we must have looked the most helpless trio with this little black girl. So the immigration official said, come in and we'll see what we can do. So they led us into Minneapolis and they arranged the whole process of immigration, which I had never intended. <laughs> so I say to people, I'm probably the only person who immigrated into the United States by accident. <laughs> But it was one of the most decisive events in my career because I've, I've lived now from 1963 to 1993. That's 30 years, unplanned, but planned by God. Now, in 1975, my first wife died. And 1977, I was invited to join a tour to Israel led by Cardinal Sunans, who was the Catholic charismatic cardinal from Belgium. He was going to celebrate his 50th year in the priesthood in Jerusalem. So a group of people including Bob Bumford and Charles Simpson and others were invited to go along. And I never really thought that I'd find myself in an Armenian church in the old city in Jerusalem laying hands on a Catholic cardinal to celebrate his 50th anniversary. I mean some of the situations that you get into you don't expect. Well, when the rest of the group went home, I said, now, I believe it's time for me to go back to Israel, because I always knew I was to go back. So I stayed a week beyond the rest of the party, and there was a, a ministry there that had been circulating my literature and even translating it into both Hebrew and Arabic. And so I thought I owe it to them to go and say thank you. And I had received a letter from them in the course of business about something and written in handwriting at the bottom was, I want to thank you for your ministry, it has meant a great deal to me, Ruth Baker. So I thought, well, I'll thank the lady. And I said, is there a lady named Ruth Baker that works here? And they said, oh, yes, but she's sick. She's injured her back. She's at home. Well, now I have had it for years, a ministry for praying for people, people with back problems. So I thought I really could, couldn't be so callous as to do nothing about it. So I said, do you think she'd like me to pray for her? They said, oh, yes. And they phoned and arranged it all. And I was being driven around by a young man. We set out to find the house, got lost, wandered around Jerusalem for about 30 minutes. And eventually I said to him, listen, David, 
it's no good, we just can't find it, God doesn't want us here. And we stopped the car right opposite the house. <laughs> so I went in and there was this lady lying on a couch and I could see from her face that she was in pain. So I was a little hesitant when I said, um, I have a rather unusual way of praying for people who have back problems. I check their legs and if they're unequal, the short leg grows out and then you know you've been touched by God and you just take whatever you want. Has anybody ever seen me do that? I'm sure somebody must have. Yes, okay. It still works. I didn't plan it. I mean, I, I would never have thought of such a thing. If I have time, I'll tell you how it worked with an Israeli. But um, <coughs> So I said to this lady, do you mind if I ch check your legs? I mean, <laughs> she said, okay. I checked them. They were absolutely even. Now, that's very unusual. Very few people have absolutely even legs. So I said, that's most unusual. The only people that have even legs are people who have been prayed for. Did anybody pray for you? She said, yes, you did. <laughs> and without knowing it, about what, six years, seven years earlier, she'd been in a meeting and I'd prayed for her. Well, when, I, when the legs are equal, I have to find somewhere else to start. So I said, well, the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. I laid my hand on you, gave her a prophecy, and thought that's a job well done and took off. Now, my last night in Israel, I could not sleep. I didn't even feel sleepy. So I just lay there and sometime after midnight, I had a vision. And I knew the vision was about returning to Israel. It was a vision of what they call uh, Mount Zion, which isn't Mount Zion. The very steep hill on the west side of Jerusalem. And there was this zigzag path going up the hill, steep. And I knew what God was showing me was the way back to Israel will not be easy. It'll be uphill and it won't be straightforward. It'll be zigzag. But the thing that impressed me most, right where the path started, there was a lady in this vision in a rather unusual dress and a rather unusual position. And as I looked at her, I thought, that's the lady I prayed for the other day. <coughs> well, what really made things difficult was I felt the Lord was saying, I want you to marry that lady. And I said, Lord, I don't know her, I don't love her, how can you ask me? But the Lord didn't answer. <laughs> so I said to myself, now this is where Pentecostal pre preachers get into trouble. <laughs> I'll be very discreet. So I did nothing but pray for a month. And at the end of that time, I still had this impression. <coughs> By that time I was back in the States. So I wrote the letter, a nice tactful letter, and said, if you should ever be visiting the States, there is a fellowship in Kansas City which is very interested in Israel. I know they would make you welcome. Well, I got a letter back saying I'm coming next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a phone number, and I can't go into the details, but we ended up arriving at Kansas City Airport within five minutes of one another. And Ruth had her her youngest daughter with her. So we spent a few days together and we talked about Israel and the Bible and so on, but nothing very deep. And then I had to go to South Africa for ministry. And uh, I said, are you going to be back in Israel? She said, yes, I'm going to be back for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Well, I had planned to return from Africa through Jerusalem and be there for Yom Kippur. So I said, maybe we'll meet. Then I preached, the last place I preached in, in, in South Africa was Pretoria. And it was a rather wealthy church. And they gave me quite a generous offering. And I'd always had an ambition to buy a South African diamond. So I said to the pastor, can you help me? He said, yes, the best jeweler in town is a member of my church. So Monday, he took me to his shop and showed me all the diamonds and the benefits and the blessings of all of them. And I chose one that I liked. 
And I had a little money over, so I bought what they call a tiger's eye, you know what that is? Very, a double tiger's eye. Then I sent a telegram to this lady saying, meet me in the King David Hotel for breakfast at 9 a.m. on a certain day. And I thought, now this is going to settle it one way or the other. <laughs> so I, I spent, I was staying in the King David Hotel. Nine o'clock, I was down there in the lobby, I'm 10 to 9, sitting in a chair facing the revolving doors, saying to myself, will she or won't she? And promptly at nine o'clock, in she walked. So we had breakfast, and you know, if you know Israeli breakfast, they're pretty ample. We sat and talked, and I wanted to know everything about her, so I pumped her about a life story. Then we went out and sat beside the swimming pool, and I went on asking questions. And then I said, maybe we should have lunch together. <laughs> so we did. And I was still asking questions. After a while she said, I'm sorry, but I'm too tired to answer any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I was very, very tactless. So I said, I think I need to tell you why I wanted to have breakfast with you. So I said, I was praying, and I saw you in a vision, and I felt the Lord wanted me to marry you. <laughs> and she said, yes. <laughs> she had her own struggles, but we won't go into that. So then I slipped my hand into my pocket, pulled out a little packet wrapped in paper, and said, it so happens I have a diamond. <laughs> which she is now wearing. <laughs> so if you want to know about that story, <laughs> it's in God is a Matchmaker. There's a lot more besides that story, but it's not just for people who aren't married. There's a lot of other chapters in the book, but lately I've met three couples, two in Britain, I think one in the States. They said, each of us got the book separately. We didn't know the other. And here we are, married. So, it works. Now, I have to go on because we've, we're running out of time. So, we got married on 17th of October. <laughs> you know, you always have to check with your wife, you've got the right date. 1978. There were a lot of things happened before we got married, but anyhow. And. Uh, then I knew we were to move to Jerusalem and in 1980 we started to build a house. That was a long story and I can't go into it, but once is enough to build a house in Jerusalem. <laughs> you have no idea what's involved and it's not getting any easier, I don't think. So from 1981 through 1989, our Jerusalem home was really a base for worldwide ministry. We hadn't planned it that way. But, and we made three journeys around the world in succession. One of three months, one of five months, and one of seven months, ministering in many different countries. And I think it was partly a fulfillment of the word in, jo in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. The law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I think God <coughs> wants to restore Jerusalem as a center for the truth of his word. And God chose certain of us, myself and Brother Lance Lambert, who's a close friend of ours, and it is happening that way. The word of the Lord is going forth from Jerusalem. Then in 1990, 91, we took a so-called sabbatical to seek God because we felt we'd arrived at a, a crisis somehow we were going to, our ministry was going to change. Meanwhile, our ministry had grown worldwide, so that now we touch almost every nation on earth with teaching material in cassettes, video cassettes, books, and through the radio broadcast. My books have been translated, part of them at any rate, into 50 different languages. We have 16 of my books now in Chinese. And there'll be just about that number in Russian. But um, I just want to conclude by saying this, that 
while we were on sabbatical, God dealt with us, I would say, ruthlessly. I don't have time to tell you, but it was one of the toughest periods in our lives for both of us. Myself, I became critically ill, and without antibiotics, I probably wouldn't be alive. But praise God, I've bounced back. I'm flourishing, for which I give God and the doctors the thanks. Years ago, I wouldn't have thanked doctors, but I've, I've humbled myself and acknowledged I need doctors. That's one of the things God dealt, God dealt with us both primarily about pride. And he showed us the, a remedy for pride, which is confess your sins one to another. And it's difficult to remain proud when you've confessed to each other the various sins. And God brought back to my mind sins I had committed 40 years before. And he said, I'll forgive any sin that's confessed. But if it's not confessed, it's not forgiven. And that's a very searching thought that I don't want to go into. But as, at the end of this, this uh, sabbatical, God finally, we, we, we gave six months. We thought that would be plenty to find out what our future is. At the end of six months, we didn't know a thing. So we took an extra month and a half. And in that period, God showed us that from now on, our primary ministry is intercession. And our home in Jerusalem is to be the base. And I am to go and minister, but only where the Lord specifically sends me. And I'm here this evening because I believe the Lord specifically sent me. So there we are. That's a little story. I want to say the future of Israel is in the hands of the Lord. Things are not going to get easier. Later on in this series, I'm going to deal with the prophetic picture of Israel and their future.